the last few people arriving now. And then I'll be handing over to Jonathan Rouston to welcome you all and introduce what we're here for today with Perspectiva. Great that we're managing to connect with so many people from all over the world, just who I can see in there. And some people's names, people have written where they're from. That's very exciting. One of the, the joys of Zoom, which we must find the joys of Zoom. Okay, so I think we've got the last few people trickling in and I think now would be a great time for us to just start our event. So I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan Rouse and he'll introduce uh, what we're all here to be a part of. Jonathan. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, I'm on to just checking. Um, so yeah, welcome, thanks for all for coming. Um, you're here mostly to hear from Mina, um, but I'm just gonna make a few comments about the hosts. Um, I'm, I'm director of Perspectiva, which is a research institute in London. Uh, we work as a kind of collective of scholars and artists and activists um, to think deeply about the connections between things. Um, our tagline is systems, souls and society because we're interested in the connection between the big issues in the world relating to economic systems and political systems, but how they reach the sort of interiority of human beings, the souls and uh, psyches of human beings. And then of course, how we speak about that in public. So systems, soul, society is kind of what we're about. But we're, the Research Institute also has a, a sort of social arm, uh, uh, a, a movement in the making even, and that's Emerge. And you can see the Emerge website in the invitation. It's whatisemerging.com. And Mina recently wrote two essays for that website, which will help to contextualize the discussion. But the main thing I wanna speak about is this wonderful book, which I think you can see. Um, it's called Sensuous Knowledge. And um, before we get to any questions, I just want to say, Mina is, uh, it, you know, her website is fabulous um, and the best place to go for further information. But on the back of the book, it tells us that she is a blogger, a social critic and lecturer, founder of the multiple award-winning blog, Ms. Afropolitan, and her work is published in numerous places. She sits on the advisory board of the African Feminist Initiative at Pennsylvania State University and the editorial board of the Interdisciplinary Journal for the Study of the Sahel. Mina is listed as one of the 12 women changing the world by Elle magazine. She lives in London and is regularly in Lagos, Nigeria. So Mina, um, I'd like to start just by asking you um, to speak of the story of the book vis-a-vis -vis the story of her life. Great, thank you, Jonathan. And um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here this Friday afternoon to, to discuss with you and um, thanks to Perspectiva and to Emerge for inviting me and giving me the, the, the platform to speak about my book and about exusions, which we'll get to. So um, Sensuous Knowledge is a collection of essays about universal topics like art and identity and blackness and womanhood and beauty. Um, and these are essays that are interwoven with, with this theory or this concept that I refer to as sensuous knowledge. And what this concept is about, um, in a nutshell, is synthesis. Um, so it's about interweaving different elements and different realities, um, interweaving emotional intelligence with rational thinking. Um, I'm, I'm seeking to interweave science with art um, and perhaps most essentially um, our inward worlds and our inward embodied realities with the outward realities. So it's a kind of mind, body and spirit approach to knowing. And I was motivated to write this book um, because of the current predicament that we find ourselves in, and I don't mean specifically COVID-19 or Black Lives Matter protests, but you know, these, these kinds of pressing situations that are leading us towards social catastrophe of varying sorts for a long time now. 
Um, and and I had spent I've spent just about over a decade writing and speaking all over the world about race and blackness and gender and sex discrimination and feminism. And one of the things that um, always strikes me is how in activist spaces there's this um, there's a strong desire um, and, a, and, a, and an intention and of actions that follow um, in terms of ending forms of discrimination of all sorts, um, ecocide, sex discrimination, racism, classism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, um, all of the very many different types of discrimination that exist. And yet there is, there was, there's simultaneously uh, a missing part, which in my mind is the kind of narrative um, with which we try to, to uh, eliminate these systems of oppression. Um, so for example, when we speak about power, which we'll get into uh, later, we are trying to, you know, how, how do we challenge systems of power using the same language that those who abuse power use? Um, and so what I wanted to do with sensuous knowledge was kind of provide a new, a new paradigm of knowing um, so that one that would match the, the intentions of the spaces that I occupy. Um, it's by no means the only paradigm of knowing that is new and thinking about synthesis and interweaving different realities. Um, but I, I wanted to specifically make it one that also brought in um, feminism and race and black feminists and, and African stories. And I contrast sensuous knowledge to a, a, a framing, a concept that I call Europatriarchal knowledge. And first of all, I do this because I think that we need to, in order to challenge a system, we need to, we need to name it. And we need to name it quite specifically um, in order to not, to, not to castigate and condemn everything that it has produced. And certainly by Europatriarchal knowledge, I don't mean um, white men, but I mean the, the, the system, the way that we think, the kind of knowledge that this dominant system has produced. Um, and so what Europatriarchal knowledge does, um, which is in contrast to what I'm calling sensuous knowledge, is that it, um, rather than synthesize and interweave and integrate emotional and in intellectual intelligence, among many other things, uh, many other polarizations and contradictions that exist in our world, it creates fragmentations. Um, it, 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 it seeks to sort of separate and um, catalog things very rigidly. And again, as I was saying, there are uses for this kind of knowledge in certain circumstances, but when, when it comes to society, to, to human relations, to our relationships with the non-human natural world and with each other, um, this is a very dangerous way of, of, of looking at the world. So um, that, is what the book is about. Okay, thank you. And um, in the contents, you have you know simple, a simple description of different things the book's about. You know, of knowledge, of liberation, of decolonization, of identity, of blackness, of womanhood, of sisterhood, of power, and of beauty. And we could speak about any one of them. And the reason I was drawn to speak about power, I think, is that. Um, we're in a moment where a lot of people are trying one way or the other to deal with what we're facing. Um, however you describe it, some call it, you know, um, for some see it as a, a primarily uh, an ecological cat catastrophe. Some see it as a more epistemic problem of how we know and, our, and, and how, the, how the information is getting to us and how we make meaning out of it. Some see it as a meta crisis in which there are so many different aspects of the problem that it doesn't make sense to focus on any one of them that actually there's, there's a sort of underlying generator function that's somehow creating all of these problems. But whenever people try and deal with them, they're looking for some kind of power. So they're either trying to influence governments or they're trying to create movements or they might be creating new uh, social enterprises. But there's always some underlying notion of here's, how, here's the power we have and here's the power we're gonna use. But what I liked about your description in the book is that you say it's better to understand power not so much in terms of power over 
or even power with, but you seem to have a notion of power as somehow a feature of reality. Like you had this notion that power was not something that how we move around the things in the world and put some up and put some down, but rather power was somehow endemic and a sort of feature that we could get in touch with through nature. Um, so this kind of blew my mind and I wanted just to focus on this. And I think you put it better in your own terms, but um, you came, came up with this term exusions, which I was drawn to just charmed by aesthetically, first of all, and then analytically also, once I looked into the meaning of it. And tell me a little more about your particular thoughts on power, what they mean today and why exusions is one of the better ways to understand it. So yeah, I was really um, interested in looking at what power is um, because it felt to me as though there is something in this. I mean, first of all, let's say, let's make it clear that you know, power is something that we're all striving for. We all, as as Jonathan just said, we 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 need power um, from the moment that we're born. Really, like we are, we are both um, in order to to become the humans and, and the adults that we eventually become, power is such an essential ingredient. It is also very unevenly distributed, um, actually, from the moment that we are born, whether we are born uh, male or female, or um, depending on which environment we're born in and how polluted it is, and so many different factors. Um, and so power being such a central concept to human life and to human relations and to our, our cosmos, um, I found it troubling um, and also interesting how few attempts, and particularly um, feminist and decolonial um, attempts there were to, to redefine power. Um, and what I found was that quite often when, when power uh, was being discussed, we were looking at concepts such as power over, which um, in my mind is more accurately could be called dominance or manipulation or control, things like that. Um, and then you have uh, many scholars who have looked at concepts like uh, power to, which again, I would say is more accurate, accurately described as um, enabling or um, manifesting or something like that. And power with is simply put solidarity, um, collaboration, togetherness. And so I wondered is, you know, is there something that is just power? And that was what then drew me to nature. This wasn't a calculated process, however, it was just a need to, to sort of take a step back and try to understand the, the, on, the ontology, the, the concept, the aliveness in this concept. Um, and it was while I was going through this process that uh, the, the, the notion of exusions emerged. I, I could not actually tell you the exact moment that happened and why and whether I had read the word somewhere or anything like that, but it instantly felt to me um, on my tongue and in my spirit and, and in, in its um, etymological references, even though there's some tensions there possibly, but it just felt like something um, that encapsulated what I was beginning to identify that power in itself was. And what that was, was a sense of, um, of becoming, you could say. Um, and so if you wanted to, to bring other terms that were sort of similar to, to how I define power, um, the word will, uh, for instance, which, you know, willpower, for instance, uh, speaks to this kind of closeness. In, in grammar, um, but the difference between will and power is that will has more of a, when you have a will, um, there's more of a demarcated goal. You know that you wanna get something quite specific and particular. Um, another word that's quite similar to how I'm referencing powers is manifesting. Um, but there's something with manifesting that is um, very automatic and with exusions there's more there is more intentionality um, and so becoming would be kind of the I would say that exusion sits under the, the, the bracket of becoming and it can be quite useful to separate becoming into the two words that, that constitute it to be and to come and that's really what is um, encapsulated by exusions. There's that sense of, of just being, 
which is very important at this point in history to, to, you know, to center ourselves to, and to, to, to know ourselves, to be, and then to come, um, which connotes a sense of being present and being present with others and, and arriving. Um, so, yes. Okay, so that, thank you. So you say in one of the Emerge essays that the, how we describe power is almost more important than how power manifests. It's almost like the idea of power is already a form of reality. It's already something that has real effects. Um, and I'm wondering, vis-a-vis -vis the word exusions, to think about that for a second. Let's imagine everyone tomorrow buys your book and it's, um, people think the key idea in this book is exusions. And if only we understood exusions better, the world would change for the better. Can you talk me through in that thought experiment what that might look like? In what way would my life look different by thinking of power through the lens of, I think, nature partly, but also I think through, you say somewhere about the being and becoming that's in tune with everything else that's being and becoming. And that power is somehow something that we are, not merely something we can have. So how would these reconceptualizations of power make a difference if we take it on board? Okay, so um, the, it's, I'll just briefly talk you through the, the methodology behind exusions, and that is something that I call branching. And branching is the, the gram, grammatical structure of exusions, and it is these, um, these dendritic patterns, so dendritic means tree-like, um, dendritic patterns which can be found everywhere in nature. So, you know, when you think of a tree, how it starts from the root and then it's, it divides into, into branches, which divide into further branches and so on and so on. And you find the same pattern in, in rivers and um, in, if you were to take an aerial view of mountains, you would see the same pattern. You see it in lightning. You also see it in our bodies, so our pulmonaries, um, arteries, the capillaries in our lungs. And what marks this, this branching pattern is this very essence of becoming. Um, and also, uh, the, it has an ecosystemic quality to it because you can never quite, it's like the chicken and the egg scenario where you can't quite say if, if the branch, um, if it is the root that gives life to the branch or if the branch comes out of the root on its own. And that really speaks to something that is central, perhaps the most central thing to exusions um, out of many things that are central, which is um, reciprocity. And so if um, everyone who bought my book were to say, yes, let's implement exusions, what we would be doing is looking toward how we can uh, implement and create St not structures actually because that's something we want to move away from but but kind of realities and spaces and and thinking that is rooted in this idea of of reciprocity mm -hmm. um and so what i think we would especially do is create um and enable tools that promote reciprocity and that are life affirming so it wouldn't be to have this rigid idea of an institution where it works you know in X, Y, Z pattern, but rather you have a tool. So something like, um, you know, when you have open source uh, coding, for instance, that provides people with a tool that is in itself inherently about networking and reciprocity. So it's that kind of thinking. Okay, great. And vis-a-vis -vis the context of the book as a whole and your work as a whole, um, I mean, the, the book title is very interesting for me because it's called, called Sensuous Knowledge, which is already like, ah, what's that? But then it's like a black feminist approach. And I'm like, okay. And then, I'm for, then it says for everyone. I'm like, ah. So there's a lot going on just in this sort of opening words before you even turn the page. Um, I, must, I can see why exuberance might be a form of sensuous knowledge. Um, and I can see why it might be for everyone. Can you tell me in what sense it might be black feminist? And, and, and in what sense that we might be, people like myself might be missing something there in terms of the roots of it and the, and the, the tenor and ethos of it. Sure. Um, so one of the things that is really central to black feminism that many people are not aware of is that um, black feminism has always had inherently this synthesis approach, um, even if it is not called that by every black feminist. Um, but because 
black women, um, you know, identity wise are more prone to be experiencing discrimination based on uh, our, our gender as well as our race and quite often also class discrimination and also um, living in areas where there is environmental degradation and pollution. Um, we have always approached the question of ending discrimination in this multifaceted way. Um, also, Black feminists have uh, inherently understood that in order to, to challenge what I call the Europatriarchal knowledge paradigm, um, we have to, to incorporate poetic, um, erotic language. And this is also because uh, all around the world, both Black people and women for so long were denied access to educational systems and to power positions. And so very often um, you find historically that Black and women of African heritage used um, artful tools. So, you know, dance, music, uh, poetry, pottery, all of these types of things to, to build knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so exusions being a, a concept that, that is, you know, it's, it's mythological, mythopoetical, you could say. Right. Um, it's also feminist and um, philosophical. It, it, it does this thing that black feminism advocates. I see. So it insists on being many things rather than one thing. And it's and it sort of, it's epistemically vibrant, you could say. It has many forms of knowing baked into it. And also, yes, and, and also I think importantly, it is um, because power, because the groups that have been excluded from power um, have been women and indigenous communities and black people and people of color generally and nature, um, exusions has this message of, of resistance within it, um, right. which involves bringing in the knowledge of these groups. Okay, great. Now you said that Europart patriarchal knowledge or knowing um, is not just about white men necessarily. But I wanted to just challenge, not challenge, but inquire into um, something like what would happen, you know, what would happen if we, if we were to change Europatriarchal knowledge in such a way that over time with the right sets of shifts and the right forms of inclusivity and changes to working patterns and forms of power and exusions and there was this sort of transformation such that we had something that resembled, let's say for the sake of argument, um, Afro-matriarchal knowing, right? Let's imagine society became, over the course of some decades, Afro-matriarchal. Now, no doubt there's a shadow side in Euro-patriarchal knowing. It might have science, technology, uh, and it might achieve a great deal in terms of what it builds, but it destroys a great deal. It might be ecologically blind. It might be inherently sexist and racist. It might have all sorts of problems with it. But I'm curious to know, vis-a-vis -vis the alternative way of knowing that you're introducing, what do you see as some of the risks inherent in it? Because I think people find it more credible when they sense that something is not a panacea, but rather one of many new ways of thinking. Well, your question points to why the title is sensuous knowledge and not Afro-matriarchal knowledge, and also why it is, the subtitle is a black feminist, not the or you know, the, it's not, it doesn't have an, any kind of imposition. Um, and, and that is really intentional um, to be open and, and sensuous knowledge to be something that is for everyone. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, your patriarchal knowledge has a shadow. And if we were to have a, a, a dominant paradigm of knowing that was Afro-matriarchal in nature, that would also have a shadow and that would also be divisive and and exclude groups of people so it's certainly not aiming for that but i but what it is aiming for is to to elucidate and enlighten people with the awareness that you know what might be afro matriarchal knowledge in nature um, has a lot of riches for instance this thing about synthesizing and the poetic and the erotic and because we are so indoctrinated and dominated by Europatriarchal knowledge, we are missing out um, on very valuable insights from other groups. So it's not about saying that, you know, we should have Afro-matriarchal knowledge or black feminist knowledge even 
because of, you know, because this group of people have been excluded. It's because the knowledge that we have been producing and many other indigenous communities um, and so on have been producing is knowledge that will enrich everybody. Right. Um, so, so that's a really important distinction to make. Okay, thank you. I was, I was actually drawn, I mean, the, the title, adding for, adding for Everyone on there was a big deal for me. Like, I, I, I mean, to confess the challenge of speaking of such issues, whether they're race or sex or gender, um, they're so heated that it's quite hard to even begin to talk about them. And then when you feel you're invited into a world, a different way of seeing and knowing that's clearly not your own, and yet you can be welcome within it. Um, just wanted to commend you for and your publishers for making that part of the invitation because it was very important to me. One last question, I'll give it to the audience. Um, exusions is based on the etymological root exousia. Uh, I think that's how you say it, which I believe is from ancient or classical Greek. Um, and it also sounds a bit like insouciance. So just the last thing, just to leave the audience with this notion of exousions a bit more tangibly. Tell me a bit about the word itself. Um, because often when people forget everything else, they may remember that word. So a little more on that, please. Exusions, um, as Jonathan just said, is indeed um, from the ancient Greek word exousia. And again, as I said previously, I was, I'm not quite sure where it came from um, to me, but it, it felt like some kind of automatic writing or, you know, when an idea just, just lands on you. And um, I recall starting to research this word and then discovering that it, it meant power um, in ancient Greek. Uh, there isn't very much information about how it was used other than references in the Bible. The, the reference that, I, um, that I'm familiar with is when Jesus, um, he, he enters the sacred temple um, after having been around spreading his, his word and his message. Um, and he returns to Jerusalem, I think it is, and he enters the sacred temple and it is filled with merchants selling goods and, you know, just um, self-interest and what today we would refer to as, as hyper-capitalism or something. Um, and he, I'm sure many of you know this story, um, he, he, he throws these merchants out and then um, the king asks him what what exousia do you have to do this? So what power do you have to do this? Um, and I found this, this biblical story to, to be really interesting because it, um, you know, it, it, it speaks to the kind of anti-capitalist and spiritual reference that, I'm, that I was interested in developing with exousians. Um, but it also has this connection with the, the knowledge systems that I'm critiquing. Um, so the, the Euro patriarchal, the Bible is certainly something that belongs um, to a great extent in the Euro patriarchal knowledge paradigm. Um, but I think it's really important to point out that regardless of the etymology of the word exousia, um, what, what alert me to it more than anything is just the way that the word feels, the, the, the way that it, you know, what it kind of evokes in, in myself and hopefully in people who are reading um, my essays and my book on the topic. Um, yeah, and, and also um, I thought uh, retrospectively, I've been thinking, I've always been very fond of the word insouciance, um, particularly within my feminist work, because insouciance means kind of boldness and disobedience and irregard to authority. Um, and so if insouciance is addressing that, that rebellious spirit um, to an extent on, on an internal individual basis, exouciance is addressing it uh, when we come together as a collective and, and we seek to affirm life and to affirm love and to, to affirm justice and power rather than to um, conform to authority. Fabulous. Thank you, Mina. So Pippa, you're welcome to uh, take the reins again, if you like. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mina, for speaking and bringing your wisdom to us. And um, I might just recommend we just have maybe 30 seconds of silence and we just allow some of that to land um, because it was so, so much richness in, in 30 minutes that let's just let that land with us. <laughs> 
and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions um, that you want to put to Mina. Um, so if anyone has a question, if you can raise your hand, uh, which you do by clicking on participants, in the bottom right corner, you click on more, and it should have the option to raise your hand. Um, fantastic, lots of questions. Um, I'm gonna start by unmuting uh, Dominique. Dominique, if you want to give us your question. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Mina. That was a super interesting talk. Um, I actually do have your book. I must admit I haven't read it all yet, but I'm going to do so. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to hear a bit more. One comment I was going to say is that when I saw the, the, um, the name of the talk was Exousience, I kept saying it wrong and saying Exuissance because I'm half French. And so I thought that there was really this lovely sort of sense of saying yes. And um, also um, in French, there's jouissance, which is orgasm, but it's also sort of joyfulness. So I thought that was a nice mistake on my part. But I also wanted to ask you about um, the spiritual aspect of uh, sensuous knowledge and how you think of that together with the the eroticism that you talked about. So maybe, yeah, just a little, yeah, something about that. Thank you, Dominique. Thanks for um, buying my book. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. And thanks for the great question. And also, um, just before I respond, I am very fond of the concept jouissance. Um, and generally, in, with the kind of French feminist and continental feminist work, um, and I know that this is a concept that features quite heavily in the work of people like um, uh, Julia Kristeva and Luce Irigare, um, for example, if you're interested in, or maybe you already know their work. Um, the spiritual and the erotic. Um, well, it, I mean, within the word, within the, the term sensuous, there is a, it, it carries the, the meaning of these both, of both the spiritual and the erotic, as well as um, the intellectual and so on. So um, sensuous differs to, to sensual in the sense that it, uh, where sensual is about the senses, the five main senses, sensuous is precisely uh, meaning, it was coined by the poet John Milton, and he meant it as something that integrated the mind, body, and soul, because he was trying to describe what poetry did. And so when you think about sensuous as something, as, a, as an approach to knowledge, which integrates the mind, body, and soul, um, you can kind of see more clearly how both spirituality and eroticism are, are embedded in this concept. Um, it, it's important to point out that spirituality is something that is extremely individual and personal. Um, everybody has uh, their own interpretation of what that means. And so in the book, I'm, I, I point out that the way that I'm talking about spirituality is basically a kind of uh, a life force, um, a kind of internal essence that we all embody, um, which connotes our, our memories and our attitudes and our moods and the, 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 the general mood with which we might approach life. Um, eroticism, uh, the, the, the writer Octa Octavio Paz, I can't remember his quote exactly, so I'll paraphrase, but he describes eroticism as a poetry of the body. Um, and I find that to be really beautiful because that's something that isn't, and, and sim similarly to sensuous knowledge, it isn't about, strictly about the sexual connotation of it eroticism. It is also about the, you know, there's something erotic in, in how we connect with art and how we connect with nature. Um, and here, uh, somebody who, whom I've cited in both essays about exusions is, is a German philosopher and biologist called Andreas Weber. Um, and he speaks about something uh, which he calls the an erotic ecology, um, which I find absolutely wonderful because it's it's, it's speaking to how our relationship to nature is, um, is not this thing that should be dif distanced and rigidly defined, but something that is close and embodied. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dominique, for your question. And Peter, I'm going to unmute you now. Well, I'm trying to unmute you. Eva, that doesn't, I can't seem to un unmute Peter. Yeah, neither can I. I've oh, asked to unmute. Um, oh yeah, here we go. I've done that myself, actually. <laughs> well done, Peter. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, hello, Mina. It's uh, uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to uh, to speak to you. Um, I'm always interested in the contrast uh, between the single-mindedness of power and powerful strategies. You know, the Euro patriarchal model and uh, the way in which it's it's obviously aligned to uh, capital as well. It's very single-minded. Um, it's rather monotonous and it's uh, highly successful. Those of us who are interested in resistance and transformation are very good at proliferating new models and definitions of power. And I think there's a risk there. So I just wonder what your thinking does to inform, um, I mean, does it inform a critique of our resistance? Does it offer new ways of opposing the monolithic forms of power that we live under? Um, is there a theory of change, more effective uh, transition? Um, would it inform movement building, for example? So that's, I'm just wondering about the extent to which you inform and maybe critique the uh, tools that we use to deconstruct Euro, Euro patriarchal power. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, so one thing that uh, is interesting to reflect on is, um, you know, there, we have many concepts that people like ourselves, and I'm just going to assume because we're all joining this, this conversation, which has a spiritual and a poetic and a resisting element to it. Um, we have a number of concepts that we probably quite often refer to. So, you know, in the kind of yogic concepts of pranayama um, and there's chi um, in Taoism, there's something very similar between exertions and these types of concepts. Um, so in that, in that spirit of um, augmenting the, the life force and, and uh, encouraging self-knowledge and self-awareness and groundedness, However, what is different in exusions, and this is really important because we are at such a critical junction in, in human history where so many things are shifting, um, but yet too many things still remain the same. Um, and it is very much a time of, of contradiction. Whichever issue we look at, it is just so full of contradiction. Um, and so what is important to note is that with exusions, there is uh, a political aim. So in, in difference to, you know, a, a concept like prana or chi, um, there is, it is a, it is a response and a, and a critique of what you accurately said, this kind of single-minded Euro-patriarchal knowledge system. So it is very intentionally bringing into a political and philosophical and poetic space this, this conversation about interiority really, and about the erotic and about the poetic and all of these things which um, Europatriarchal knowledge tries to suppress and deny, which, which obviously, as we can very evidently see around us, only leads to, to violence. Because when you suppress emotions, when you suppress such a key part of who we are as living beings, and when you destroy our natural habitat, and when you, make our relations between each other so hostile and competitive and violent, um, then obviously we're not going to be able to, to move forward. So, so this is a, a theory of power, which is very much about um, empowering ourselves inwardly and outwardly, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it has the spiritual aims, but it also has political aims. So it's, um, it's trying to, to do a very small task at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Uh, Rosa, I'm going to unmute you now, I hope. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Mina, thank you so much. I feel so deeply moved. I'm not even sure that I can talk, but um, I, I will take a breath first and then offer my um, my my comment and question. Um, wow. Um, to begin with, I, I really want to appreciate what Jonathan said about um, the beauty I'm feeling in bringing forth the wisdom of Black feminist knowledge in such an invitational way to everyone. Um, and then I just, I'm feeling so moved because I, I'm, I'm feeling so strongly about how, how uh, redefining power um, can be so helpful. I've been reading um, um, uh, a white feminist from, from way back in the, the 70s or 80s, Sonia Johnson, and she wrote about how it's so harmful for us to continually use words like the men in power uh, to refer to the people who are at the head of the patriarchal py pyramid. And she talks about how no one would resort to violence unless they were desperate. So she suggests we start not just thinking, but talking about them as the men in weakness. So the men in weakness have ordered a bombing of Iran, the men in weakness have da 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 Not to be anti-male here, but to really understand that there is such a difference between, you know, that, that power is the ability to create, and there's such a difference between that and the, the alienation and suffering and existential anguish that leads people to destroy as a way of trying to affirm and assert themselves. So I'm just fascinated by your also talking about essence because um, there's, um, you know, there was so much, there was, it, there's this whole thing about internalized uh, oppression and how people who are oppressed can attack one another. And there have been so many wars in feminist thought in white feminist thought, like essentialism and anti-essentialism and like that. And I'm looking at a paper right now that I just finished reading so that the timing of all of this feels so crucial. What is your essentialism is my imminent flesh, the ontological politics of feminist epistem epistemology. So I just, I would, I would just love to hear more from you about any, uh, any and all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, wow, yeah, that's, that really addresses a lot of things that I'm also, um, fascinated with and perturbed with in equal measure. Um, so I strongly believe that the way that we define power is the antecedent to our structures of power. And so I am troubled often in feminist work by how, um, because power is defined in a particular way, which is connected to patriarchal values, what many feminists have been doing for a long time is uh, sort of advocating, uh, creating new models of thinking in which rather than challenge how we define power, we are trying to redefine, we are advocating for women to become more like men. Um, and so obviously when you, when you start to talk about these things, there's this risk of being accused of essentialism and so on and so forth, as you ac accurately um, pointed to. But I do think that it's not about there being a particular way that women are, you know, there isn't a female mind, absolutely not, there's nothing like that. Um, but this idea that in order for women to access power, we have to behave like men, which have, and men have been socially constructed, uh, generally speaking, into a, a, a gender that is uh, very dominant, um, out of touch with their emotions. Um, and so we should, what we should be doing is both women and men should be sort of denying that very rigid definition of masculinity and femininity. Um, and th that is where it becomes so central to actually redefine power and think of power, not as something that is about dominance and violence, because obviously, if that is how we define power, which is what most academics do and what most of our popular culture does and the media does, then obviously people will 
behave in those ways once they accumulate power. Uh, so it is, it is really important that we redefine power and that we do so with a feminist intention. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, Brent, I'm going to unmute you now. Uh, hi, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks for your talk, Mina. Um, before my question, for the benefit of the audience, I just want to, to foreground my direct connection in, in how you got here, which is Black metamodernism. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm pleased to have your powerful voice here. Um, so you and I had a brief conversation the other day, and you suggested that I'm more radical than you. And, and that being said, I defer to you on Black feminism. But I, and I also try to embody it myself and in my work especially, but there's limits to that. And so, my, so how can we mutually uh, be mutually empowered? Uh, because in this moment and in general, I feel you have a degree of power and I feel disempowered. And that's no fault of yours, um, but perhaps some other people. <clears throat> and uh, if I may say, you chose to not speak on the US riots, whereas I would like to. So the question is, how can we all hear each other's voices in this, reg in this regard in order to hear the voices of the people in the streets and in particular black people? How can we overcome our fears and elevate each, other, each other's strengths in this community in particular? Um, thank you, Brent. I don't want to get into any kind of, um, you know, uh, external stuff. Um, but yes, Brent introduced me to Jonathan. Um, so that's a wonderful connection. Um, I, the only one thing I, I do want to address is I don't, I don't know that you're more radical than I am. I, uh, and it's, it doesn't matter who is more radical <laughs> than the other. Um, what matters is that we, we absolutely share the same desire to change society. Um, the riots are such a vast topic that um, it would need an hour on its own. It's not something that I want to, you know, put into a pigeonhole, into a small segment of exusions, um, because it is something that I care about deeply. But what I, what I think is, you know, to answer your question, um, we need to change as I've been saying all the time, we need inward change as much as we need outward change. Um, and that is something that will ultimately benefit black people um, and everybody else, you know? And, and so what I hope that these, this revolution, this, this social revolution that thank God is uh, taking place now, I don't wanna say finally, because we've had many moments like this. And to be honest, I'm, I'm somewhat cynical that this will result in this great revolution that, that I do hope it will. Um, but what we have to realize is, as I was saying earlier, we are living in this contradictory moment. I mean, even if you just look at uh, the situation where our streets have been so empty because of lockdown and COVID-19, um, and then all of a sudden the streets are filled with people because of Black Lives Matter. And I, and I really think that as much as it was unexpected, I'm not surprised that race and racial injustice is the one thing that would draw people into so much emotion, you know, whether it's anger or, or fury or rage or hope and courage and, and determination, which are all parts and parcel of this. Um, but it is this very, what we need right now is in conjunction with fighting for structural change and better representation and more diversity, it is absolutely imperative that we also are fighting for new paradigms of thought, which, um, which speak to this contradictory nature of our times and which not only speak to it, but assuage and, and provide people with clarity about how we can address this. And, and this is why sensuous knowledge is explicitly black feminist in nature, because there can be a tendency um, when we're doing spiritual work that we forget about the political. Um, and so, as I was saying before, exusions um, is a spiritual, but it is also a political con concept. It is a response um, because the reason why we are where we are has historical groundings. Um, so yes, this is, this is you know, why I started my talk by saying that if sensuous knowledge is anything, it is a, a synthesis. Um, and it, there's no easy clear cut view to this. It is about bringing in the political, the resistance work, um, you know, all of that, the protest, 
but also the, the deeper inward grounding, meditative, poetic approaches. And, I, and I'm really, as much as I'm encouraged and you know, I'm admiring the sense of unity and people of all backgrounds and ethnicities coming together to, to take a, a stand or a knee rather with black people, um, I'm not convinced that it will be ultimately as, as revolutionary as it needs to be if we don't bring in this synthesizing approach. And so that's why um, I'm, I'm speaking about all of these things in combination. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Brent. Um, uh, we've only got time for one last question. So uh, Nicholas, I'm going to unmute you and apologies to anyone who's not going to get their question in today. Thank you very much, Pippa, and thank you, Minna. I had the pleasure of meeting you at Lisbon in November, and I have your book, which I'm still in the middle of reading. Um, I wanted to raise a subject which actually we spoke about when we first met, um, but which I feel would be useful for the conversation. And that's uh, the idea that uh, part of our Europatriarchal thinking is a very important part is science and the the myths around science and the realities around scientific thinking, which of course is developing, science is developing, but which has in the past uh, very much underlined the notion that we are our brain up here and the body is an appendage. Um, science has talked in those terms for a long time. It's no longer talking in those terms. If we now look at what's happening, uh, there's a very new area which for me is very exciting which is the discovery of what's happening in our gut that we actually have a second brain which was in fact our first brain because for four and a half billion years it was the only brain around and this is fantastic for me because i think this uh, automatically creates a new paradigm of thinking if we're prepared to take it seriously enough uh, and so i would was astonished and very happy to discover in the first few pages of your book that you refer to a Nigerian um, uh, myth, whatever you like, story that uh, actually highlights precisely this, this thing. And uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the consequences of, of that. It's great to see you, Nicholas. Thanks for joining and thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, very briefly, I, I start uh, my book with a, a, a Yoruba, um, which is the, the, the ethnic group that I belong to in Nigeria, a, a Yoruba concept, uh, a mythopoetic philosophical concept, um, which is called Ogbon, and Ogbon means wisdom. Um, but in Yoruba, you divide Ogbon into Ogbon Inu and Ogbon Ori, which is um, you could translate as intellectual intelligence and emotional intelligence. And in the story from the ancient gods, um, it goes that if a person or a society only had either Ogbon Inu or Ogbon Ori, they didn't have wisdom because you needed to have the two. Um, and so I make this, I kind of contrast this with Daniel, um, Daniel or David Kahneman, can't quite remember now, um, but his, his uh, book, Fast Thinking, Actually, I can't remember the title accurately, um, but he's a Nobel Prize uh, economist or behavioral scientist, and he um, he has a very similar scientific theory to Ogbon Inu and Ogbon Ori, which he calls System One and System Two, um, referring to I'm sure many of you have, have, are familiar with this work, but here again we have like the intellectual and the emotional being separated. Only that, according to Kahneman, um, the intellectual is above the emotional so they're not as integrated um, as they are in the Ogbon theory and so my argument is you know it's not that there's any problem with science of course not it is that um, you know there is a there is a poetry um, there is a lyricism and uh, and even an eroticism to science uh, in the same way that there is a, a logic and a, and a rationalism to emotions and it's again bringing and interweaving these two together that is that is so central right now because uh, you know like we have i mean as a, as a black woman for example i know the game of 
Europatriarchal knowledge so well. And um, my apologies to Jonathan to make a reference to chess, but it's almost like, you know, I can, the, the science, the game of science over emotions, over all of this fragmentational um, knowledge production is a game that, that I can play um, and that so many of us can play, but it is, it has done me so much harm and it does the world so much harm. So we need to, um, yeah, just, just bring these two together um, and, and, and synthesize and, and evolve because ultimately, um, you know, there's this, there's an underlying sentiment with sensuous knowledge, which is that we can live in a higher dimension than the one we live in right now. Um, but how are we going to get there? How are we going to get to this higher dimension? Because I think we can all agree that the way our world is right now, it is absolutely not that. So, you know, how do we get there? Um, that's the question. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And uh, thank you, Mina. And what a amazing sentence to end on. There is a higher dimension, but how are we going to get there? It's a real <laughs> takeaway quote to think about. Um, so we've come to the end of our time together. Um, of course, Mina's book is available, um, Sensuous Knowledge. So please do check that out if you haven't already got a copy. And also her uh, essays on the website whatisemerging.com. We will email everybody to let, make sure that you have that information so that you can find Mina and um, see what other work perspective is getting up to. But just to close, we we wanted to just have a moment together. So um, Evo's going to unmute everybody's microphones and we're just going to have a minute together in silence, again, to let some of these thoughts land and for us to really be together and, and think on these things while the noises of life are around us. So Evo, if you want to unmute everybody, we'll just do that for a minute and then we'll, we'll close and uh, go on our ways. Yeah, it seems everyone still can uh, has to unmute themselves so they can do that right now. Okay, everyone, if everyone wants to unmute yourself, maybe that's also a symbolic moment. We need to unmute ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Just taking a minute to be together. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, time to go. We'll see you in a higher dimension soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.